I think I'll go. I think we'll go ahead and get started if that's okay, uh, Jacob. Unless you see people actively joining on. Sounds good. I think uh, you know it's it's five oh three. Folks will be able to pick up uh, wherever, and of course, you know the details of all the feedback are on the uh, on the web page for the Rolani Arch, and the recording of this video will be posted there as soon as it's available, likely tomorrow sometime. Excellent. Well. Uh, Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Artie White, Administrator of Comprehensive Planning at the Tallahassee Leon County Planning Department. I'm joined with uh, Jacob Fortunis, who will be helping uh, with some of the technical assistance side of things. Uh, we'll go through a presentation to begin with, uh, and then at the end of it, we'll kind of open it up and uh, have people unmuted and they can ask questions and raise their hand and things like that. Um, but the purpose of tonight is really to just kind of go over uh, some of the more notable changes that have occurred in the or that are being proposed for the Wallani Arch Master Plan since it was transmitted to the state, and we'll kind of walk through that. But uh, we'll also uh, have some time for Q and A at the end. Um, here we go. It's working now. Um, so a couple of things that we'll cover today are the uh, the things that are being proposed to change in the master plan based on a number of uh, different things. Uh, first, um, once it was transmitted to the state, uh, it goes to the state land planning agency, that's the Department of Economic Opportunity. Uh, and it also goes to some other state agencies and some regional planning entities. Uh, we re actually received some technical assistance comments back uh, from DEO and some of the other agencies, uh, Department of Transportation, Fish and Wildlife, Dep Department of Environmental Protection, and the Department of State. Uh, we then <clears throat> also held a series of what we're calling charrettes, but basically uh, that's uh, 11 different video conferences as well as a self-paced virtual workshop. Uh, that's that survey monkey tool that some of you may have used. Uh, we received a proposed Greenways Park uh, plan from Keep It Rural. We also received uh, a letter with some questions and some comments from the Alliance of Tallahassee Neighborhoods, ATN, uh, kind of prepared jointly with Keep It Rural, uh, and then had a series of uh, quote unquote in person uh, virtual kind of uh, using WebEx uh, meetings directly with Keep It Rural. Uh, we had a meeting and a follow up letter from Tally 100, primarily kind of focused on uh, the city's clean energy resolution and how that would in be incorporated into the Wallani Arch Master Plan. Um, there are a lot of like smaller changes that have occurred that you'll see. Um, when you have a chance to look through the, the Bologna Arch Master Plan update, uh, but I'll go over some of the more notable ones. Uh, first, one of the things you'll see is that instead of just having you know, three or four land use districts or categories, you know, um, the rural, uh, the um, residential, residential reserve and mixed use, we actually organized this master plan into more distinct districts. Uh, that allowed us to get a little bit more nuance with the land use planning uh, and also account for some of the differences uh, that you see across the Wallani Arch. Uh, as part of that, we are looking at doing more of a, a gradual transition of densities and intensities within those districts. Uh, that is um, something that I'll kind of show on some maps in a moment, uh, but instead of it being you know, most dense, most intense and mixed use and then kind of going into residential, uh, there's a little bit more feathering. Uh, with that, we also updated the phasing, and I'll show a map of that. Um, specifically, trying to tie phasing not only to development thresholds, but also to the provision of infrastructure and services, uh, things like school, fire, police, as well as you know water and sewer. Uh, one of the the most notable things, and kind of the way I'll run the presentation here, is uh, moving away from just having the one map that was kind of the land use map but also having a transportation map and a preliminary environmental features map. Uh, trying to reorganize the way open space is managed so that it's more connected and continuous, uh, basically more of an open space system. 
uh, you know, we received a lot of feedback, uh, particularly from ATN, on affordable housing. And so I'll walk through some of the changes uh, that we have with the housing policies that are currently proposed in the master plan. And then also one of the major themes was stormwater facilities master plan. And so I'll kind of talk about that as, in, in a moment as well. Um, so the first map of the three is the land use districts map. And you can see on here that uh, we actually have five districts. So the, the number one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, one, the Northeast Gateway District. Then you move into the West Arch. If you're kind of going clockwise, uh, then the North Arch, the Conservation Design District, and then the Residential Reserve District. You know, each of these districts, well, four out of the five districts have a mixed use component to them. Uh, and they kind of range in densities and intensities. Uh, the more intense, the most dense would be the activity center and the employment center, which would be in that first district. Uh, the second one is a town center. Uh, that's not quite as dense and intense as an activity center or an employment center, but it's a little bit more intense than the village centers. And then so three and four would each have village centers. And then you can kind of see around those um, a kind of on here purplish pink uh, circle. Uh, those represent mixed use neighborhoods. Um, those would have you know, a little bit more of a uh, mixture of uses than a traditional just res residential area. Uh, the idea being that it would be a little bit higher density residential with neighborhood scale, uh, commercial and retail kind of integrated into it. Uh, these would be about a quarter mile to a half mile around those mixed use centers. And the reason we chose the quarter mile and half mile, um, you know, not in, to get into too much planning jargon, uh, but those correspond with a pedestrian shed or a bicycle shed. Uh, that's essentially um, how far people are comfortable walking or riding their bike uh, within a five minute time frame. And so the idea is that you have a little bit more density, a little bit more mix of uses around those mixed use areas. Uh, before you kind of feather into slightly less dense, uh, kind of primarily residential areas. And then you see the residential areas. Uh, we have the low density residential that would be the buffer between the activity center and employment center and the Buckhead neighborhood. Uh, that's, if you're familiar with our comprehensive plan now, that's largely based off of our residential preservation land use category. Uh, and then you move into district three and two uh, and those are uh, residential districts, which are primarily based off of our urban residential land use category. And then four and five, uh, those would both be uh, cluster subdivisions. One of the things that we heard through the, the charrette process was, you know, we don't like the idea of charrette or uh, ranchettes. And so we kind of removed that provision and focused primarily on uh, cluster subdivision and kind of talk about that a little bit more as we get into some of the other uh, other maps. And with the phasing, I noted that we added an additional phase. So uh, districts one, two, and three would be phase one, district four is phase two, and then district five would be phase three. And previously we had one and two, uh, just two phases. Uh, and kind of the, the tipping point for moving from phase one to phase two was purely based on uh, a threshold of residential development and uh, non-residential like commercial retail development. Uh, but we decided that it made more sense and, you know, a lot of the feedback that we got, um, you know, supported that was that it should also be timed with infrastructure and services. And so if you don't have adequate school capacity, if you don't have adequate fire and water or fire service, police service, uh, then don't do more development. And so we tied the phasing to both thresholds of development as well as infrastructure and uh, public services. Uh, the second map, uh, and this is a new one uh, from the transmittal, is a preliminary environmental features map. And we say preliminary because a, uh, a developer of the, any of this property would still have to do a natural features inventory as part of the PUD phase of the project. Uh, but we have a pretty good bit of data that we can go ahead and start looking at and planning things out now. So we included that preliminary environmental features map. A couple of things I'll point out on this map are, uh, you can kind of see circled in purple. Uh, those are the areas that we anticipate being uh, either high quality successional forest or native forests. Uh, and those are uh, defined in our conservation element of our comp plan as either preservation areas or conservation areas, both of which would need to be protected. 
And so we kind of noted those here. Um, the bigger circle you see on the far eastern side of that uh, in the dark blue is actually a uh, what we call a core forest area or core, core canopy area. Um, the urban forest master plan that the city of Tallahassee did, uh, I think about two years ago, uh, called out areas that are needed to be protected uh, that weren't at the time. And uh, that's part uh, core canopy or core forest areas that are part of a system that are greater than 500 acres. And uh, that part is. And so, you know, while we're kind of working on uh, some land use regulations that would provide for some of that protection, uh, we went ahead and included that in this master plan. Uh, another thing that came up both from uh, our comments from Fish and Wildlife and DEP and uh, numerous citizens through the Charette process was the need for wildlife corridors. And so what we have in the plan uh, is actually uh, a proposal to make sure that everything is connected, uh, continuous and contiguous, uh, and so that they could serve as wildlife corridors. Uh, basically, it kind of goes from uh, some areas now that are uh, adjacent to the Miccosukee Greenway, uh, uses the open space uh, that we know about, uh, and then also, in addition to the existing canopy protection zone along Miccosukee, uh, there'd be an additional 75 feet on top of that, uh, with the purpose of that being to support the wildlife corridor, and then everything kind of coming together in that core forest area. Uh, on the eastern side of the property. Uh, with that, there's also kind of a network of open space that would be created kind of through the process. Um, one, we still have the greenway around the perimeter of the property. We actually updated the, the alignment of that on the map to reflect the um, Leon County Greenway's master plan uh, before we just kind of had a dashed line that went around the property. Uh, but this is actually a little bit more accurate because that Greenways master plan took into account uh, different environmental features uh, and things like that. So we thought it was a better representation. It would still need to go through uh, design. Uh, and I believe that's the part of the Northeast Gateway project that Blueprint is doing. Uh, but it's at least a, a more accurate uh, alignment than what we showed before. Uh, in addition to that, um, there was a lot of conversation about a regional park uh, near the schools. And so we've identified a potential active park. We call it potential now because it would require additional action by uh, either the city commission, county commission, or uh, the blueprint IA uh, before that came to fruition. But we wanted to make sure we at least called it out as an area that would be appropriate to have it. Uh, and you can see it's actually um, you know, not defined specifically where it would be, uh, but the general proximity would be between the schools and those uh, forested areas. Um, that I showed in a few slides ago. Uh, the idea of that being uh, one of the things that we're proposing in the master plan is a trail network that would go around the perimeter of that forest area you see just south of the schools. Uh, that being both recreational, uh, but also would serve as a natural fire break uh, to help with the management of those forested areas. And so you would have a regional park that would then tie into a trail system. So the idea would not be to build the, the park where the forest is, uh, but make sure that everything is connected. Uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier about cluster uh, development in districts four and five. Uh, we have provisions in the master plan now that uh, talk about how uh, you know, within that development, you would concentrate your development on 40% of the property, and then you would set aside 60% of the property as a reserve area. And we wanted to make sure that that reserve area was actually connected and coordinated. And so there's policies in the, that we've proposed in the master plan that require those cluster subdivisions to have uh, continuous and contiguous reserve areas. And so while it's kind of you know, just white space on the map now, uh, as development happens, each subsequent PUD would have to account for the previous one uh, to make sure that all that green space comes together in more of a system. Uh, we've added a transportation map. Uh, this was one of the uh, topics that came up frequently in the charrettes. Uh, and this transportation map does a couple of different things. Uh, for pedestrians, it talks about uh, where the pedestrian facilities would be. Uh, in the mixed use centers and those neighborhood, kind of mixed use neighborhood areas, uh, the requirement would be for sidewalks to be on both sides of any local street. 
Uh, once you move into the residential areas, you'd have to have a sidewalk on at least one side of every local street. Uh, for those uh, thoroughfares that you see, those are the larger roadway network that you see. Uh, those would have, require uh, pedestrian facilities on uh, on both sides of those facilities. Uh, for cyclists, uh, the master plan has been updated to kind of more specifically address cycling facilities. Uh, those could be uh, on-street bike lanes. They could be protected bike lanes. Uh, it could also be you know, shared use paths. Um, and you kind of see how the emphasis on the uh, those mixed use areas would be kind of the on street facilities uh, with potentially doing the shared use path uh, connecting those. And that's that kind of teal blue versus the dark blue areas on this map. Uh, we also know that anytime these bicycle facilities intersect the Walani Arch Greenway, uh, that they would have to provide access and connectivity to that greenway. For automobiles, a couple of different things. Uh, we've noted that. Uh, the Walani Boulevard, the kind of north-south one, uh, would be designed as a boulevard. It's a, it would be an arterial road according to uh, you know, transportation engineering functional classification. But in terms of the design, it would be a boulevard, uh, and that specifies you know pedestrian facilities, landscaping, uh, tree trees. Uh, the other roads would be designed as avenues, um, also with bicycle and pedestrian facilities, landscaping, street trees. Uh, but those would have a lower design speed, so ultimately um, uh, not carry quite as much because at some point the the traffic would uh, diffuse across the system versus being concentrated on the boulevard. And so we wanted to reflect that the intent of these would be to be lower speed uh, than the boulevard. Uh, for transit, we've included policies that uh, in multiple places that specifically require each PUD to uh, do a couple of things. One uh, is coordinate directly with Star Metro to ensure that the transit facilities that are needed uh, or anticipated uh, within that PUD uh, would be included. Uh, the PUD is also required to address how transit would provide connectivity between the transit hub that is proposed in the toe or the heel. Uh, it's in the master plan for the toe and the heel. Uh, connectivity between that transit hub and those mixed use areas. So uh, those PUDs specifically have to address transit. And then we're also trying to be forward thinking, um, recognizing that you know, technology is changing and we are kind of anticipating certain things happening. Uh, each PUD will specifically have to coordinate with both the planning department and the underground utilities and public infrastructure department to address uh, electric vehicle charging and uh, infrastructure necessary for connected and automated vehicles, uh, aka self-driving cars. Uh, to, we want to make sure that as development is happening, we are proactively planning for the infrastructure to support these things. Uh, another thing that I'll note here uh, is that uh, while we're kind of requiring each PUD to directly coordinate with us to ensure system-wide infrastructure, uh, we've also included policies that let each PUD provide incentives for both uh, electric capable and electric ready uh, or electric vehicle ready and electric vehicle capable uh, development. And so um, those incentives being you know, higher for uh, EV ready versus EV capable, because we want to make sure that we're incentivizing uh, people to do above and beyond uh, and not just hit the minimum. Uh, housing affordability was uh, you know, something that came up multiple times in the charrettes. And uh, so the master plan has always had the inclusionary housing component of it, basically saying that the Wolani Arch would be a part of the inclusionary housing ordinance. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we wanted to address not only inclusionary housing or affordable housing, but you know, housing affordability broadly. And so we've required more of a range of housing types. Uh, and then um, there's actually specific languages in, in the, the proposed master plan that say that no district or zone within a district can only have single family houses. So we're not uh, allowing anyone to just require single family houses. Uh, 
you know, one of the, the strategies that we as planners use is what we call the missing middle housing. That is that range of housing. Um, I think a lot of people are becoming more familiar with that term, but if you're not, there's a graphic at the bottom of this slide that kind of demonstrates that. Uh, basically, the idea is that uh, most communities, including ours, have uh, a number of single family detached homes, which is kind of your regular you know, standalone home and apartments. But there's a whole range of housing between those two extremes that are often overlooked and are often you know, missing, missing middle uh, from communities. And that's everything from duplexes to quads or fourplexes, townhomes, uh, as well as a couple of uh, building types that uh, we don't have here currently. We do have some duplexes, we have some quads, even some triplexes. Uh, but to my knowledge, I don't believe that we have any cottage courts uh, or other multiplexes um, that I'm super familiar with. There may be a few here and there. And then on top of that, uh, we provide for the PUDs to include uh, incentives for affordable housing. Uh, what that does is allows our housing team to specifically negotiate affordable housing uh, as development comes on board. Uh, and then the stormwater facilities master plan, this came up numerous times. Uh, one of the things that we heard multiple times during the charrettes was that uh, in terms of the, the way the policy was written for the toe and the heel uh, and that, that master plan uh, within the Walani critical area plan, uh, that it was actually you know, very effective, uh, worked really well. Uh, note that a uh, developer in the in Canopy uh, did break some regulations, uh, but in terms of the way the policies were written, uh, they're quite effective. And so what we've done is modeled the stormwater facilities master plan component of the arch after the toe and the heel uh, and kind of coordinating very closely with our growth management department, as well as our underground utilities and public infrastructure department to make sure that it's something that is effective and uh, implementable. Uh, and then we've kind of tied the, the stormwater planning with the, uh, the phasing of the development as well. Uh, as I kind of noted earlier, we want to make sure that development happens as facilities become available and not have um, you know, development move forward before there's adequate infrastructure and capacity uh, and public services. Uh, so overall kind of next steps for this, uh, if you go to the website, talgov.com slash Wolani Arch, uh, it's most likely where you found the link to this, though you may have uh, got to it from social media uh, or the um, newsletters that went out. Uh, but if you haven't been to talgov.com slash Volani Arch, I encourage you to do that and go there. Uh, there's the current version of the master plan with the edits that we're proposing. Uh, two versions of that, actually. One is a clean version. It's a little bit easier to read. Uh, but if you're interested in seeing specifically what has changed since uh, Transmittal uh, to now, uh, there's a strike through underlying version as well. We put together a summary document of the input that we received through the charrettes. Uh, and then we provided an overview of uh, how we addressed uh, if, where, and how we addressed the comments uh, in this proposed version of the master plan. Uh, there is a public comment form on there. So if you want to submit comments through that, you can. Uh, as always, you're also welcome to send them directly to me. Uh, for those of you who don't have my email address, I'll drop it in the chat in a moment, uh, but it's artie, A-R-T-I-E dot white at talgov.com. And so feel free to either use the comment form or just email me your comments directly. Uh, we're gonna take feedback. Uh, actually, I've started kind of looking at some uh, additional revisions based on this version of the meeting that we had on Tuesday. Uh, and if you haven't seen that, there's a video recording of that available on the website as well. Uh, and as we start uh, understanding the overall schedule of this, uh, we'll be updating the website with that as well. Uh, one of the things that we'll be adding very soon is uh, there's a workshop currently scheduled for October 13th. Uh, as we understand the time and the location and the format of the meeting, whether it's in person or virtual, uh, we'll be updating the website with that information as well. Uh, and I think at this point, uh, we are ready to go into Q&A. Um, let me go ahead and exit out of that. Stop sharing my screen. Uh, I can bring this back up if it helps as we're having Q&A. Uh, but Jacob's gonna go through. Uh, if you haven't already, you should be able to open up the participants uh, list. If you kind of hover at the bottom of your screen, there should be an option to do that. 
Uh, if you have that open, you should be able to quote unquote raise your hand using the little hand icon. Uh, and then if you aren't able to do that, you can also use the Q&A feature or the chat feature. Uh, and Jacob will kind of go through and uh, kind of facilitate that and I'll answer the questions the, the best I can. Yeah, folks, if, uh, if you have questions, please just, as already mentioned, open up your panelist uh, function in your application here. You'll see a, uh, an icon with a raised hand um, that, you can, that you can put up if you have some input. At which given time, I'll uh, I'll unmute you and we can we can have a conversation about whatever input you have. And already currently, we only have a, we have one question in queue, um, and that is from uh, Dara Osher, who I'll unmute at this time. Try to. Um, and Artie, you might need to shoot me the host function. Oh, yes, I'll do that. Uh, sorry about that. I've relinquished the host function. All right, I appreciate it. Dara, you're unmuted, but I'm going to go ahead and read your question that you posted. Dara wants to know, why go with on-street bike lanes for some of the internal roads? Why not opt for protected bike lanes or shared use paths for all new roads? We we didn't necessarily restrict it to on street bike lanes. Uh, it's one of those things that um, as we kind of get into uh, the design of those facilities, we'll uh, uh, address that. Was that a question? Um, yeah, I think if if uh, if there has any further input. Uh, please just reach out to me in the chat function. Um, okay. I, have a, I have a couple more questions in line here. Well, well before you go on to that, I'll, I'll also say that one thing that I uh, forgot to mention, I think during my presentation uh, related to automobiles was there's a, the thoroughfares that we talked about. Uh, there's also policies uh, that within those mixed use areas that it would be a gridded street network. And uh, you know, that does a couple of different things. One, it provides for better access and connectivity kind of throughout a network of streets uh, versus kind of disconnected cul-de-sacs. Uh, you know, I thought we had uh, Shao uh, for all that. And then at the last meeting, we actually had someone point out that one time we said should. And so I'm, you know, addressing that as well. So uh, if other people see similar comments, uh, we can also address those. But, um, you know, with uh, bicycle planning, sometimes we look at, you know, A streets and B streets. And you know, some streets might be better suited with on-street bike lanes. Others may be better suited with uh, protected bike lanes, and then others may be suited for shared use paths. And so, we'll, that's something that will kind of be designed uh, as that street network is designed. Great, uh, good question, Dara. Um, I have three folks in you already. We have Wendy Gray, Greg Kaufman, and Stephen Martin. And Wendy, I'll be unmuting you now. Wendy, are you with us? Um, uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, hey, Wendy. Okay. Hi, Ari. Um, can I just ask a question? I can't see who the other participants are. Is that the way the system functions? That is kind of how we set this one up. Um, the format was a little different since uh, instead of us kind of trying to do what we would do around the table, uh, this mm -hmm. is more of me trying to report back um, what we heard and okay. how we changed things and then just kind of verifying that uh, if there's other things that we missed or if we didn't quite get it right. Uh, so the format's a little different because the, the purpose is a little different. I see. So thank you, uh, Jacob. <laughs> you got it. I, I posted the attendees in the chat function in okay. case uh, um, other attendees want to know. I, oh, I thanks, Jacob. Jacob questions but i'll just ask uh two if that's okay and then give everybody else a chance um the land use acreage table was removed can you explain how come it was removed and also i had trouble calculating the uses but i'm particularly interested in acreage for open space uh, yes and uh i'll, I'll do both of those uh, we tried to move the the overall table into the different districts 
so we could get a little bit more nuanced with it instead of just having overall acreage within each district we can give both a uh, overall acreage and then a range of intensity and density we can also require i think in some cases we require there to be uh, a specific range of mixes of housing types uh, and it was getting a little bit too complicated to try to address all the nuances of each district within one table. And so we tried to diffuse that out. Um, one thing that actually came up at the last call was the, the overall acreage of open space. Uh, and that was not intentional. And I'm actually working on, based on that, a uh, way to incorporate that one back in. So that was uh, a good catch. I was glad, uh, I think it was Pam Hall who actually brought that to my attention. And so we're working on adding that back in. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll let other people go. Thank you. Yeah. And the, the overall acreages would still be the same as what they were in the original table, um, but we can, uh, so when you see, uh, hopefully uh, after this, we'll kind of tweak the master plan based on these comments, uh, and you'll see it was still, it'll still be the same range that was in that original table. Thank you. Great. Uh, Net, Wendy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute you now. Thank you. And Greg, um, are you with us, Greg? I just unmuted you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Appreciate you guys doing this um, and following up on some of the charrettes. Um, I didn't get a chance to read all of their strike through changes, but I read the summary uh, reports of the charrettes. And Artie, I didn't hear you. I saw on the reports that it mentioned dark skies, but I didn't hear any reference to dark skies initiatives or lighting um, in the presentation tonight and I'm just wondering is is this not the appropriate time or is there is that still on the table uh, no it's still on the table and uh, if you when you do get a chance to look at um, the the master plan uh, you should see that referenced in a couple of different places uh, it was not one of the the quote unquote bigger changes uh, so in the for the sake of time that was one that I, I didn't necessarily hit on tonight uh, but uh, do go, uh, in fact, you can probably just do a word search when you get a chance for dark skies. Uh, and then if you have additional comments on top of that, um, definitely feel free to send them to me, but I did try to try to address that. And then I had one question about the road network. So the, the, the prongs that come off onto Miccosukee Road, um, I'm wondering about the location for those. And so I live in, I live off Miccosukee Road, off of Argyle, so Miccosukee, Meadows, and Kimberly Estates. And for us to get to I-10 right now, we have to go up the Crump and then go back down Mahan and use that interchange. But So I thought maybe, you know, the way the road network would be designed with this project is provide an opportunity for us to access I-10 via this new road network. But it looks like it takes the roads would take you off of Miccosukee to a town center and then kind of loop back around to the the interchange. So it seems like is the idea that like folks that live along Miccosukee Road now towards Crump would still the most convenient route would still be going to to Mayhem to access I-10. I think you would have that intentional. Uh, no, I think, you know, with the, the connectivity to Miccosukee, it was mostly us, um, one, following uh, some agreements that were in place, you know, prior to all of this about uh, how many and where uh, road access would be on Miccosukee, but two, trying to make sure that, you know, we don't, we don't generate, you know, unnecessary or additional impacts to the canopy road. And so, um, it probably would still be if you're there. I think you would kind of have a choice between either uh, going to the proposed interchange with I-10 at Bologna Boulevard or uh, kind of continuing to go to Mayhem. Will those those connections with those roads at Miccosukee Road will those be traffic lights, stop signs? You know, what what's the intent as far as the interchanges? Um, that's something that we really won't be able to know at this point. Um, that's all based off of traffic volumes uh, and things like that. So as PUDs come in and we kind of get a, an understanding where in that range of densities and intensities they'll be, 
the traffic engineers will continue to look at um, the impacts to the roads and determine that uh, if uh, certain treatments are needed versus others. So if the if it hits a certain threshold of traffic, then they probably would put in a signal, but it probably wouldn't be installed until they until they hit a certain threshold. For what it's worth, I would advocate for stop signs to Walani versus backing up traffic on Mexico Road. Because already now, when school's in session, um, you know, the, I've only been here for ten years, but I've already seen traffic starting to back up further and further up Mexico Road from Capitol Circle. Yeah. All right, thank you. All right, appreciate it, Greg. I'm, I'm going to mute you now. Send me a message if you have any further input you'd like to make. Next in queue is uh, Stephen Martin. And Stephen, I've unmuted you. Are you with us? Yes, I am. Hey, Stephen. Uh, hey, already. <laughs> All right. <laughs> As always, I got plenty to say. I will try and maintain my composure. I just heard about traffic. Yeah, I mean, traffic's a problem, but you know, of course, what always contributes to traffic, getting more people and having these areas developed. And if we really wanna curb traffic, let's think about curbing the population, the number of folks we want to bring in. Human beings have not done a very good job managing their population, but that goes beyond the scope of this. All right. Wildlife corridor, as you mentioned, the charrettes. There were some of us who are skeptical about having relatively narrow corridors be a means at which wildlife can coexist over the long haul. I mentioned this before, before canopy was put in, and we had that whole toe as a contiguous area undeveloped, it could support wildlife. We could coexist with it because we gave them a large contiguous area that they could kind of subsist in independently and not have to go to other areas. I think when you try and create corridors, the idea, oh, well, that'll allow them to move from area A to area B. I don't know if they're going to be able to survive over the long haul and coexist with us that way. So I heard you mentioning about 60% reserve area connected. I just hope you have these connections wide enough and i think in some cases it might make more sense to just take an entire contiguous area not develop it and then develop everything else around it rather than have interspaced areas for larger wildlife especially so there were a couple of us who were skeptical about that uh let's face it canopy has not maintained wildlife habit habitability I could see it there, but I can't see any now. And we live across Centerville Road. There is a corridor where deer used to occasionally come. Not anymore. Not anymore because they don't have something like they had before. Okay, that. The stormwater planning, yeah. And you did make mention about there have been a couple of problems with canopy, but you said it's been modeled consistent with the toe and the heel. And just hearing that, after seeing what's happened on the toe, and there hasn't been anything done to the heel yet, does give me reason for pause. And you did take, I mean, did make mention that it hasn't gone as it should have gone on uh, canopy. Well, we miscalculated there. We may be miscalculating again, too. So better to be safe than sorry. As I said at a charrette, the past is the best predictor of the future. And I, 10 years ago, I was constantly told when I was making an issue about this, you're the only person who's concerned about this proposed development that's now known as Canopy. You're the only person who seems to show any concern. We had together the Walani Community Advisory Group and they all approved it. So if they approve it, everybody else does. I don't think now I'm the only person who finds that development to have been a mistake. So let's not just kind of say that, oh, we've got this well managed and we're going to be, until I see something that hasn't been destroyed, I'm going to be skeptical. You've mentioned keep it rural folks, and I keep hearing keep it rural folks. They get listened to, they get paid attention to, unlike me. I just wonder what it is that keep it rural's got going that they get your ears and commissioners and others, and I don't. I mean, I just get pretty much written off. 
I did see Mr. Volpe's attending or was in attendance before. I didn't see Gary Hunter. I assume Gary Hunter's not here this evening. But I would I had a couple of statements specifically for Mr. Hunter. But am I correct? He's not here. It doesn't uh, appear from to be oh. on. Um, okay. But I will uh, for what it's worth. All right. I okay. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, thank you for letting me talk. I hope I maintain my composure relatively well. <laughs> I appreciate that. And I will say, uh, you know, uh, for what it's worth, I did have some conversations with our growth management department specifically about stormwater kind of following your comments on the, the charrette and uh, specifically talking about how do we learn from the, as you said, the past is the best predictor for the future. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we hopefully we can learn from the past. And so we've had some conversations and tried to make some edits accordingly. So while it's modeled after the toe and heel, it's not a verbatim same. Uh, so I'm I'm, okay. I'm trying to uh, try well, to learn from the too, past. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I think we uh, lost you, Jacob. Or you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that, Stephen. I've uh, I've muted you. Send me a message or uh, post a question in the chat or Q and A. Should you like to provide further feedback? And uh, folks, I don't have any further participants in queue for Q and A. Um, Artur, you might want to spend another minute or two in case folks are sussing out their technology. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, the chat, and so I see. Uh, comment. Um, let's see where to go. Randy's provided. Randy Danker has provided. Uh, I think up to seven uh, comments within the chat function, um, but I haven't heard back uh, from messages regarding uh, coming in. Um, it looks like Wendy and uh, Debbie uh, Lightsey have some questions to ask. Wendy, since uh, Debbie hasn't asked any questions yet, I'm going to open her up, and then I'll have I'll have you right after that. And I will acknowledge that I, I see a question uh, that came to me from Debbie Lightsey about uh, minimum density in one housing area. One says four to fourteen; the other says maximum of ten. Why no minimum if you're allow if you're not allowing large large single family? Um, I'll make note of that and take a look at that. Uh, kind of do. A search through to make sure I'm not overlooking something that um, unintentionally. So, uh, but that may not be her only question. I just wanted to make sure that I acknowledge that because I do see it coming in. And uh, and Deborah, I've I've unmuted you as well. Are you with us? Miss Lightsey? Uh, no, she's still muted. Can you make sure she's unmuted? There she is. I'm so sorry. Deborah, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hey, Debbie. We can hear you. Hey, Artie. Artie, I've got a, a, a question related to, directly related to the one I think Pam or Wendy asked you. I guess it was Wendy. There's no table that shows the total number of acres in each district in each phase. And if, if I was a policymaker, and I was for about 100 years, that's one of the first questions I would ask, and that information is not in there, or I couldn't find it. And so um, I think those tables ha have to be reinserted that provide that information. That's one of the first basic questions I think anybody is going to ask. And don't make them ask it. You know, put that table in there somewhere very near up front. So that they can they can see that you know you're not going to get commissioners to read these three or four things that you've posted. You're going to have to do an agenda item that very clearly highlights some of this stuff. They're not going to read it. You know they're not going to read it. So we can't pretend that they're going to peruse all this stuff or even even read the clean version. And and that hits directly on the the other issue about phasing. You can't see the total acreage in the phases. But I do see that three, the three most dense and intense districts are all in phase one. Why, why was that done? That seems like a huge glut of development. Why isn't Gateway 
and West Arch in one phase or Gateway, West Arch and North Arch in different phases. That is a huge glut because what I'm seeing is that in total, the only numbers I saw in here in total, there's going to be, I swear I saw a number that said 3 million square feet of non-residential. Sure, maybe that was in a nightmare I had, but I think that's what I saw somewhere. But it doesn't tell me where that is or whether that number, 3 million, has changed from the first version. So there's no, no way to compare any of these stuff without numbers. So can you give me some numbers today about some of this? Um, I don't know if I'll be able to give them to you today, but what I can do is go back and look and see if uh, I can put them in a table and uh, provide that and uh, kind of look at the best I way to do that. I need it provided to me. I need it provided to the policy makers, the elected officials, and very clearly and up front. But you, I know you can tell me whether 3 million square feet of non-residential is similar to the number in Original. Someone told me that they thought it was 1.5 originally. H has it really doubled in this revision? Uh, I don't believe that we've doubled it. I'm looking at it now. Um, trying to find where we put that. So it does have a maximum, and it is a maximum of uh, 3 million square feet of non residential development. Um, and it would be good to know in which of those districts that falls. If the vast majority of that comes in phase one, that's that's going to overrun the market, and that really reflects no phasing, no real phasing at all. So, I mean, surely somebody there kind of generally knows how many square feet in of this very dense, intense, non-residential stuff is in phase one. I know the um, the bulk of it would be phase one uh, because that's where the employment center and the activity center uh, are located uh, and also the town center, which is more intense. I know we were you know, generally trying to you know, keep the highest density intensity uh, to the west side of the arch. Um, Kind of capitalizing on infrastructure, the interstate entertain interstate ten interchange, Willani Boulevard, and then not putting quite as much further east, uh, largely to not have as many trips going on to the Canopy Road, uh, Mikasuki Road specifically. Um, but yeah, how, yeah, how how soon can somebody give me those numbers? You you must have them somewhere. I mean, y'all can't be in the dark about these numbers. And I'm not a numbers person. Think if I was a numbers person, how important this would be to me. Yeah, I can uh, I can pull them together. Uh, if if I get a chance to tomorrow, I will into a, a one kind of easy to read table. Uh, if not, it'll be uh, as soon as I can next week. And uh, of course, anything that I you know put together like that would also be provided to the commissioners. And what it was the first time, and how that compares to the revision. How, how big was phase one? How big was phase two? How big are they now? The acreage in each, if the total square footage of non-residential has even increased by 50%. I mean, you need to put that in there and be able to ask why, I mean, to answer why that happened, because someone is surely going to mention that, but you can't leave them in the dark uh, and not point it out to them and not let them notice. I mean, you've got to inform the Policymakers who are going to give you their action about do they like what you did or they want you to include other things, but you've got to help them give them some idea of what's changed and what it looks like. Noted. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. I'm going to mute you now. If you have any further input. Just uh, drop in the chat or in the Q and A, or raise your hand. Thanks. Okay, we have uh, we've got about ten or fifteen minutes left in our Q and A. I currently have two folks in queue. First, we have uh, Wendy Gray, who I'll be unmuting now, and uh, Randy Danker following. Wendy, can you hear us? Yeah, Jacob. Um, 
I will pass to Randy since I did have a chance to speak, but I do have a couple questions. So can I just tap type them into the chat and we'll get a response back or sure you can do that or I'll uh, I'll, I'll pop you back in the in the queue if you'd okay. like. All right, I guess fine. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Wendy. I'm muting you now. And Randy, are you with us? Yes, I am here. Uh, I already uh, submitted my comments in the chat, but I, if I could, I'd like to just go through a few things and get your responses. Um, the first question had to first issue that I was concerned about was that your uh, recommendations for interconnected conservation areas don't look a whole lot like the plan that was submitted by uh, APN and Keep It Rural. And obviously, I support their plan. Um, as I understand it, and can you confirm or deny this, that a lot of what you're including in conservation land is land that's going to be stormwater facilities or land that couldn't be developed anyway because it's wetland or something of that nature? Um, so the, the open space would include uh, some of those facilities, um, but you know, the way it's kind of set up is, you know, one, like at a minimum, those are the things that you have to, to set aside. And then on top of that, uh, any additional area would have to kind of be continuous and con connected and continuous. Uh, and we kind of talk about how uh, certain areas are prioritized. And so you know, if we have a conservation area or a preservation area uh, that would need to be set aside, not developed, um, then you know, kind of prioritizing ways of connecting those things together, uh, connecting um, or providing additional buffers around them. Uh, so ultimately, it would kind of look a little bit more robust than on the map. Um, and I, it doesn't look exactly like ATN and uh, Keep It Rural's proposal. Uh, I know one of the things that they wanted to see was uh, a large park area kind of at the north where uh, Roberts and Crump kind of near that bend, if you will. Uh, though, you know, we were looking at it and it seemed to make more sense to do that on the, uh, the more eastern part because of the, the environmental features that we were looking at uh, when we started kind of going through the proposal and uh, that area being uh, a core forest area that kind of continued uh, you know, an area of canopy that was not fragmented um, that kind of equates to an area of 500 acres overall. Uh, and so, you know, we kind of moved the concept over that of that over there. Um, I know that they had some proposals over near the Buckhead neighborhood, uh, but we've been working directly with the Buckhead neighborhood on specific uh, languages and policies. And so we opted over for what we coordinated with Buckhead over what was proposed in the, the plan by Keep It Rural and ATN. And so, uh, you know, we took a lot of it into account, but we're also at the same time um, kind of you know, coordinating with multiple entities, not just Keep It Rural. And uh, that's why we have the, what we're proposing. Do you know, I don't know if you can answer this, but do you know roughly what percentage of the uh, preservation area is uh, stormwater facilities and that sort of infrastructure or uh, wetlands that couldn't be developed anyway versus land that is just taken out for its own sake to be preserved? Uh, not at the top of my head, but I know that uh... You know, kind of what we're putting back in that table that um, was in the previous version uh, called for 30 to 40 percent of the arch uh, being an open space. Uh, you know, some of that will be the wetlands, floodplains, uh, all of that kind of stuff, uh, but some of it will also be, uh, you know, additional to that. Yeah, well, you see, that's very, I mean, I, I, I don't know that it uh, helps to argue the point, but it's disappointing to me that they're getting credit for conservation land when it's land that they were going to have to take uh, either preserve anyway because it couldn't be developed. Um, I just don't know why they get credit for that, but okay. Well, they um, did. 
we get credit for it because the the comp plan or the proposed master plan specifically says that you know they have to set it aside provide for uh, public access to it and have a management plan for these things well i mean public doesn't really have access to a stormwater pond do they i mean come on let's get real um i, I wouldn't swim in one would you i would hope not <laughs> that's why we have pools not yeah. stormwater facilities okay well i and I, I think i rest please, my please don't that. swim in them but i like to walk around lake ella i do it almost every morning and there are other facilities like lake henrietta that are quite lovely to to be at I, I don't swim in them but i still recreate with them okay um i know we're running out of time so let me try to skip over some of the other points that i wrote out um a big a big issue for me because i was involved in the lawsuit where we secured this conservation easement as a buffer for the neighborhood between the schools and the neighborhood and it seems like a real breach of faith. I see on the map that you were showing today that they're still showing that the road, uh, Wolani Boulevard, is going to go right to the conservation easement. And I don't see that addressed anywhere. And um, to me, that seems like a huge breach of faith with the citizens. Uh, there is a uh, note on those maps that says the final alignment um, will be determined by the, the Blueprint IA. Uh, okay. That's oh, because I don't. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, like on the map, because I don't know exactly where that road will come out, uh, and so that was more just kind of conceptual that there will be a north-south connection, uh, but I don't know exactly where it will be. Can you tell me anything further about whether they are planning on sparing the the conservation easement, or whether they're still planning on going through it? Uh, I actually don't know. They're supposed to let me know when they have a, a more defined alignment. Uh, but I, I don't know which way they're going with it right now. Okay. Another thing that I had um, been very concerned about was whether there would be a natural gas hookup, uh, a ban on doing natural gas pipelines and extending natural gas to Wolani. And I don't see anything in the in the master plan that addresses that. Do you know what the, the uh, status of that issue is? Uh, we did strike the uh, language about natural gas uh, from the, so when you look at the old version look and compare it to the current version, uh, you'll see natural gas uh, stricken out. Oh, so they're not going to extend natural gas? Uh, not unless they have already done some of that. Um, I don't know where the, the existing lines are, but uh, we're not putting it in there that that we're not saying that they will <laughs> before we, we guarantee that they were uh, and so we're taking that out. So, but I mean, I'm a little confused. Is that meaning that there's going to not be natural gas hookups or does that mean there might still be? I'm just, can you clarify? Um, previously, we said that there would be for sure. And we took that out. We allowed a little bit of flexibility because um, I think the city was looking at uh, other forms of gas. That's I, I don't I, I had to coordinate with our infrastructure people. They were explaining it to me, um, but then what we specifically referenced in there also was uh, that the development would comply with um, the adopted clean, uh, clean energy plans, and so I expect more specifics to come out of the clean energy plans and then this would comply with that okay well that i'm now i'm thoroughly confused but um it sounds like it's still an issue that's open am i correct P potentially um but I'll, I'll go back and look at it and okay see if it's there's a way to be clearer about it okay um then the the final thing that I wanted to ask you about was um, one of the things that I had urged in the charrette was a fiscal impact analysis to compare the cost of the development versus the cost to the taxpayers. And uh, I, I, I mean, my personal bias is I don't think that the public should be underwriting development. Do you, is there anything that's going to be done along those lines or was that just kind of um, deep sixed? 
Um, I don't know of a specific analysis that um, has been requested. Uh, but when you say, you know, public underwriting development, um, kind of what elements do you mean? Well, if the development is not going to um, pay for itself, then the taxpayers are going to have to pay for it. So um, the fiscal analysis, fiscal impact analysis would um, take a look at the cost of providing public services like roads and water and sewer and so forth versus how much money would be generated. And, you know, if that's, if that's, there's a shortfall, then obviously the taxpayers are making up the difference. I know with at least water and sewer and uh, other utilities of that nature, uh, the city provides it to the property boundary line. And then the, any developer that comes along would have to provide the infrastructure through the property and then on top of that, what's calculated into uh, utility rates that people pay is a long-term maintenance uh, consideration for that as well. Uh, roads are a little different. They're funded through a variety of other mechanisms. Um, they're not, you don't pay a, a, a user fee for getting on a road unless it's a toll road. Um, but there's, you know, transportation funding is actually quite complicated. Um, but in terms of utilities, you know, we're not the the local government doesn't usually put down like water and sewer lines and then uh as you pay your utility bill you're paying for what you use as well as the, the maintenance of those facilities so the answer is that that there isn't a fiscal impact analysis but you, you so you don't know if it's going to pay for itself I mean, I don't, I, I don't have a crystal ball and to know exactly what's going to get built specifically. And then, you know, I guess, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I appreciate the honesty. I, um, yeah, I mean, I, I have to be honest. I'm, I'm kind of disappointed with this, this master plan. I really thought it was an opportunity to do something really visionary and precedent setting. And I, I don't know. This seems like same old, same old to me. Do you have an example of a uh, master plan you think is visionary? Of one that would be visionary? Oh, well, yeah, sure. Of course, I could design something, <laughs> but I don't think this city wants me to. Um, I mean, if you have examples of things that you think are visionary, please do uh, send them my way. I always like to read other plans. And... Well, I mean, I'd like to see it be a much a commitment to much a much greener uh, kind of development with homes that are solar and that, you know, meet um, certain energy standards and more more clustering of homes and more open space and more tree planting and you know i mean there's a lot of things i'd like to see but um i i don't see it in this plan and it's it's disappointing okay okay all right thank you randy and we're running a little over um i've got i've got a two more in queue right now um Wendy, I'm going to unmute you and then uh, Debbie Lightsey, I have a, I'm going to put you back in queue just because uh, I, I had a couple of questions as well. Wendy, are you with us? Yeah. Um, first of all, just for the record, I should clarify that the greenways and open space plan was actually keep it rural. It was not keep it rural and ATN. Uh, we did submit some joint comments, ATN and Keep It Rural, but um, the Greenways plan is a Keep It Rural thing. Um, Thanks for the clarification. My, okay, my comments um, are, are not going to be, you know, already, I don't think you're going to be able to address them in like two or three minutes. So, what I'd like to do is just submit them to you um, in writing. I can do it either here or via an email. If they can become part of the record, that would be great. Yeah, if you want to just email them, that might be easier. That way you can kind of take your time writing them and then send them to me when you're ready. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. And yeah, folks, I'd like everyone to know that we we keep recordings of all of these meetings, minutes as well, um, and they're all put, they're all going to be posted or have been already posted on the uh, Talgo website. 
Um, outside of that, you can always email Artie directly. Um, and oh, yeah, I was going to put that in the chat. Put that in the chat. And then there is currently an ongoing feedback form on the web page as well. So please feel free to use that. It's all it's all recorded. And uh, given that, uh, Ms. Lightsey, I'm going to unmute you now. Are you with us, Ms. Lightsey? Yes, I am with you. Uh, yeah. You said the revisions were coming from the Tuesday uh, workshop, and, and I will note that I did not receive any notice of either one of these workshops. Um, I ended up talking to Pam, who said she participated on Tuesday, and I said, great, because already I had sent you something many days ago that said you're really not going to schedule a, a, a workshop on the 15th and never heard back, and I assumed that that meant no, you weren't. But uh, be that but as it may, if you've done revision, going to do revisions based on the workshop on Tuesday, the virtual workshop, and on today, uh, how is all that going to be disseminated? I mean, I, I appreciate how much work y'all have put into this, but those huge big documents you put on the on the uh, on the web page. Uh, looks looks more like an information uh, dump. I mean, there was a lot of information in there, but elected officials don't have time to dig through that. So I want to know if, in addition to the revisions you're going to be making or might make based on Tuesday and on today, is there going to be a new agenda item? I have I typed that question in. Is there going to be a separate and new agenda item for the workshop? which is clear and offers optional approaches on some of the big issues so that the policymakers uh, can conveniently see what the big questions are and choose an option or suggest one of their own. They're, you surely don't expect them to wander through all this information. That's not the way they work, okay? That's, and I've, I've been gone 10 years, but that's not the way they work. Uh, so, is there going to be a new and separate agenda item that gives them a chance to make input on the big issues? Or is it just going to be another underline and strike through to the huge document that's already out there? I mean, I just don't, practically speaking, that's helpful to policymakers. Um, well, it, it, it should be both. Um, the, uh, the agenda item for the workshop will include the, the strike through underline. Uh, I know that you know, some people like to read that, uh, other people may not. Um, but I know that, I well, I think it was Commissioner Minor, but I know at the, the county commission, uh, they specifically requested uh, an agenda item that kind of talks about you know, some of the, the bigger the bigger points. So uh, I'm hoping and that- what you, And what you chose to include, from the specific recommendations from the community and what you chose not to re include uh, in, in a format that's easy for the elected officials to read. But I'm more interested in, under each big major issue, some optional approaches can simply choose from that menu, or if none of those suit them, they can suggest an additional one, but they can click, 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 giving direction on each one of these big issues and not have to just muddle through with a big confused conversation, which will burn up a huge amount of time, cause a lot of a frustration and probably get you to run out of time before you get through the major issues. I'm just talking about a practical way to approach this and allow your policy makers, your elected officials, to give policy direction and not just respond to what you put in your revised document. That's not their role. They don't have to follow what you put in there. They get to think on their own, but they need to know what their options are. I mean, I don't think I would be feel well served if I was an elected official and got that huge pile of information and it wasn't sorted out so that I could get through it. And the public is not going to feel like they have been well served either if it's not set forward in a clear, concise way. And the elected officials get to say, I don't like what you put in, Artie, but I like option B. Okay. 
or I don't like any of the options you put forward there, Artie, but I want to do my own option and it is thus and such. And they could discuss it and make a decision and give you direction so you could go back and revise this thing again. I mean, that's a procedural thing, but based on 21 and a half years of experience reading agenda material. I would strongly urge that. No, that, that sounds good. Um, and, you know, commissioners always have the ability to not take what I recommend. Uh, but that's just kind of across the board. Uh, you know, I'm not the policy maker. I, uh, Take my direction and but you're the one that writes the agenda materials already. So you've got to set it out in a way that is workable for them. That's what I'm asking for. Okay. Yeah. No, they may sense. love everything you've put in here and say, go with it already, but they need to know what the choices are and were. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you, Debbie. I'm going to put you back on mute now. Folks, it looks like we've uh, we've run past our time so far for this evening's meeting. Um, I'd like to reiterate that um, the uh, TalGov website is www.talgov.com slash Wilani Arch has uh, records of all the public input to date and uh, also how we've uh, made changes to the master plan given that public input. There's also um, public uh, feedback forms on there as well to, uh, to help record um, any input that you weren't able to give previously. Um, please feel free to use those. We want to make sure that we're capturing everything that you have to say. Um, Artie, any final words for you? Uh, I'll just note that I did drop my email address uh, in the chat. And so uh, if you find it easier to uh, type up any thoughts and comments you have and send them to me directly versus using the, the comment form, you're welcome to do that as well. Uh, you can use either one. We'll be looking at both. I guess with that, uh, thanks everyone for coming out. Uh, hopefully this presentation uh, kind of helps as you read through the, the materials uh, to kind of get a better idea of what you're looking at. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us. I uh, hope you all have a good evening. Bye. And Artie, you are now the host. I got it, and I'm going to end the recording and end the meeting.